freeze are just part of the economic cycle. But one expert believes that the next boom will dwarf the one that we've just seen. Philip Anderson is the managing director of Economic Indicator Services and also the author of The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. And he joins me now in the studio. Philip, thanks so much for coming in. I know it's a coincidence yeah, that you're here on the second anniversary of the Lehman collapse, but still the timing could not be better. Yes, yeah, timing. It's what it's all about, really. It, it never, as Lehman Brothers was, was falling over, it, it never ceased to amaze me how it caught so many people by surprise. Um, and I can tell you, true, that uh, you know, myself and all of my subscribers, we were, we were very well prepared for what we thought was coming. And if you, if you trace that back through, which I tried to do in the book, you see that the such downturns that we were getting in the, the financial crisis and the real estate led were part of a cycle. And you can trace it through. You go back through 1819, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1897, 1914, 1932. And after the land price low, 1955, you get to 1974, 1991. Okay, I'm going to put the brakes on right now because it sounds really interesting. So let's get the basics of it. Um, you have done your research looking into 200 years of property history. So what yes, you just in, told in us. Yes, in the United States. Yes. Yeah, in the United States. So you do believe that we can read in to what happened 200 years ago and that it is still relevant? Uh, definitely, because the, the, the cause of it is still with us, really. The cause of it is. is um, essentially people chasing the, the land price, the economic rent, as described by David Ricardo. And that underpins the real estate cycle. That process is still with us, and it, it's absolutely 100% sure it's going to repeat uh, into the future. Okay, so walk us through it. Your basic premise is that every 18 years, there is a big peak brought on by land speculation, yes. followed by a significant trough. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's not, you, can't say it's, you can't say every 18 years exactly. The cycles have been never shorter than 17, never longer than 21. It averages out about 18. I guess if it was exactly 18, people would have seen it. It would have been trading it. You know. <laughs> so it, it wouldn't manifest that way. But it's, it, it averages out about okay. that. Yeah. And are we talking just the U.S.? Just so we can center our sort of discussion, are we... Uh, the reason I focused on the U.S. for the book was because the U.S. stock market went into all-time new highs in about 1995, very early on in the real estate cycle that they had been having. That indicated to me that they were going to have a very big boom because when... When stock markets go into all-time new highs, it signifies more production uh, within the economy. So that's why I studied the U.S. Um, the U.S. also leads the cycle. So I thought, well, if we were getting indications from them that they led the cycle, then you could follow it through the U.K. and then to Australia. So that was the idea why I studied the U.S. Okay. So where did this all start? This all started back when land started to be privatized. Pretty much, yes. Yes, it was when... You, tra you can trace it back in the U.S. back to about 1800. It was, it was in on May the 10th, 1800, when the... The U.S. federal government got together. They took the lands from the from all the states, and they started selling it off. It was a great idea. It, it allowed an enormous amount of people to come into the U.S. They they, they got their uh, they got their 160 acres. It produced a, uh, some enormous wealth, some fantastic productivity. It was a great way to to, uh, to to produce things, and it's just all flowed from there. But it does seem that when you've got that enclosure of that rent, which which in the finish the, the enclosure of that rental value of the land, when you get uh, into a price. The buying, of that price, the buying and selling of that price, when it, when it happens, you get continual chasing of it. It seems to manifest in a cycle approximately every 18 years where you get your boom and the bust. These days, when you've had uh, all of the, uh, the banks creating so much credit based on, on the buying and selling of the real estate, you know, there's, there's the banks creating so much credit these days, it's, that's where the violence of the boom comes from. And uh, that's just, uh, I can see that continuing as we get, as we get um, China and... Uh, India uh, more and more into the cycle. Okay, so so we've got the cycle beginning way back in the States with the land privatization. Why does it continually con repeat itself then? Why can't we break the cycle and stop some of these booms and then busts from happening? Uh, Nadine, that's a political question. Um, if you... I've studied that. Actually, it's, it's an interesting question because I, I, I was able to study so much of the American stuff because uh, you can base it on the history of Canberra. And for people who know the history in Australia and know how Canberra was settled, it, it was when, when Canberra originated, it was designed such that you ended up having to lease the land from the government. And when you lease the land from the government, you pay that annual rental value up front. Canberra was designed that way to actually have a zero land price, which is a concept that is so difficult today for investors to get their head around. Mm -hmm. And because Canberra originally had that zero land price, you, 
if you have an actual price, it doesn't affect the use value because you're still paying the rent, but if you have a price that's actually zero, you cannot get a real estate cycle. So it's a political question as to real estate cycles. It, you know, you have, you have the, all the, the governors and, uh, of all the Fed, they come through and they say that the real estate cycle is inevitable. It cannot, be, it cannot be adjusted and it must happen. But well, what you're saying, though, is that to stop this real estate cycle, you'd have to have the state acquiring all the land. No, 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 it's, uh, no, you'd have to have, you still have land owned. It's just that people would be paying the rent instead of collecting it. Paying the rent instead of, okay. Yes. okay. But okay. that's a political question. <laughs> not something I always, not something I normally get asked, actually. But, uh, interesting question. Well, just before we get sort of out of hand with the, the discussion gets too big. So just tell us now, what part of the cycle are we in? Because obviously we've had the GFC. We're two years post Lehman Brothers yes. collapse. So yes. how, where are we? The trick is with, and this is what I try and teach my subscribers, the trick is with a real estate cycle. If you want to know where you are, you generally have to look at the stock market. Now, to where we are at the moment, um, I don't need to give an opinion on that. The stock market is going to tell us. It's actually telling us right now, really. In the next month or two, we will know. The stock markets all topped in October of 2007. They then had their bottoms in, in March of 2009. Stock markets then have recovered since then. So we will know where we are now because, because as the stock market begins to, to form the lows that it's forming now, if the lows stay higher than what they were in 2009, despite all the bad news coming out, that's the markets telling us that despite all the bad news, the stock markets are making higher lows than they were in 2009. If that continues, then it's, it's absolutely certain that the, the previous real estate cycle is beyond us and we're moving into the next cycle. If you trace that through, if you have a look at the stock market, especially the US, what happened in 1991, what happened in 1974, if you can have a look at the way the, 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 the secondary lows formed after the lows that were because of the real estate crash, um, you can see those same patterns repeating now. And, the, and stock markets, particularly at the US at the moment, they're, they're making fresh lows at the moment, but they're higher than last year's lows. If that continues, it, we're definitely the GFCs all over. Okay, so you say that the market is now bringing us up out of this big trough. Yes. Um, so what is your general feel then of the state of the US economy? Well, I can only use past history to try and judge that. And essentially, all I know from the book and the history that I studied, every single real estate downturn, 1991, 1974, they were always described as the worst ever. Mm -hmm. But you can see from the past that the United States came back stronger and bigger than ever from every single downturn. You know, the, the United States, the people, they're very hardworking, they're industrious people, they invent fabulous products. I don't see any reason why that can't continue. So I, I just think they'll come back stronger and bigger than ever. So I, I'm just not in a bearish camp. I just think the next cycle with, with all the products that they can create, the internet, all the products that are just absolutely sen so sensational now, it, it has the ability to be really huge in the next one. Okay, well that's the States. But Australia, we obviously, as you know, um, never fell to the depths of um, many Western countries when it came to the global financial crisis. Our recovery has been swift. It's been strong. Unemployment's yes. at 5.1 percent. Yes. Our housing prices did fall slightly, yes. um, but have since recovered. And in fact, there's talk in Australia that we've got a property bubble happening. So, what's happening? Is that just our proximity to China, or you know, where do you sit? Uh, in the book, I give a clock, which helps investors try to work out where we are. Australia's been lucky in the sense that I think we certainly had a crisis. The commercial and industrial prices certainly came down. The government, in a sense, was able to stabilise residential prices through the programs that it did. It got away with that because unemployment stayed really low, continues to be, to be low. And that's happening, I think, because of another cycle I try to study, which is a the big commodity price wave, which, is, which takes its name from uh, previous economist Nikolai Kondratiev, a Russian economist from the 1920s. Don't have enough time to get into that here, but. <laughs> But the bigger commodity waves, which I think we're seeing, um, I think it's a big story. I think it's a long-running story. I think China is a sustainable boom. And I think what's happening at the moment, all I can see is that Australia really is going to kick off the next real estate cycle from a, from hot, from a very stable state, uh, which is very bullish for Australia, I think, um, overall. So I think we've had our cycle. And we're certainly going to follow um, the US and, and, and the Western nations. But the same token, with co China continuing, Australia has the chance of really moving its cycle, in a sense, to what might happen in China, uh, and China and India too. So with China and India selling off more and more of its real estate, uh, 
prognosis looks good, mm. in my view. Okay, so just um, I'm being told that we're running out of time, but I'd like to sort of get the main thrust of what we should be taking from this conversation. So you do believe that we're on the cusp of a boom. I do, yes. So, so if you're an this investor... Is, this is long term, you know, yes. it's not going to happen tomorrow. No. It happens over 18 to 20 years. But, but if you're an investor, then presumably if you plan on being around for the next 18 years, now would be a good time to start getting in. Yes, well... It, Historically, if you, look at the, if you look at the things, if you look at what it was like investing in Australia and the world, 1991, at the depth of the recession, 1974, they were great times for getting in. Now, if, if history repeats, we've got another time where I think it's also a great time to be getting in. Increasing population here, fabulous. Mm. Yeah, and so you're saying the outlook for Australia is mostly roses? Oh, that's what I think, yeah. Okay. Obviously, there'll be hiccups, but, but yes, long term, long picture. This is not just a yearly thing, looking long term, sure. Now, you did accurately predict the global financial crisis yes, and a lot of the book. fluctuations in that and it is in the book The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. Um, have you ever been wrong? Oh yes, I don't profess to, you know, let me make it quite clear. I've got absolutely no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, none whatsoever. But in the bigger picture view, mm -hmm. the economy is driven with a scientific foundation and that scientific foundation is David Ricardo's law of rent. The law of rent is to economics what gravity is to science. If you can understand what Ricardo had to say, it, the economy does follow that scientific basis. You have a look at uh, uh, the clock that I, that I showed about how real estate moves. It's been doing that for 200 years. It's the same rhythm that goes around every 17 to 21 years. The same thing's happening now that the markets are making their higher lows. Banks are, are stabilising, want to lend more money. It's just, it's just another repeat coming. And you say, or you write in your book, those in charge do not study history, nor do they have any idea how the economy actually works. You call yourself a renegade, renegade, economist. Yes. A renegade economist. What does that mean? I'm a Ricardian economist, really. I, I do, I, I do favour what David Ricardo had to say about the economic rent. This is some, this ultimately, at the end, it's a political question. But for economists, it isn't something that they really study. And I think the economic faculty would do it, would serve itself very well by studying more of what David Ricardo had to say. The brilliance of what he was doing with the economic rent, something that all real estate investors know what the economic rent is. It's simply locational value. Mm -hmm. Economists don't factor that into a lot of their models, and I think they should start doing that. All right, well, that was a lot to cover in just about 12, 15 minutes or so, but I guess if our viewers are interested in any more, they can buy your book, The Real Estate Life, uh, The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. I Do agree, you appreciate yes. you coming in, Philip? Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, Thank great. You very much. Well, coming up, we'll take a look at why investors are flocking to lock their savings into term deposits. We'll look at some of the pros, the cons, and the traps to avoid. First, though, here's a look.